Welcome, my name is Sue Richards and I'm a nurse from the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation. Thank you for being here today. Our session today is Bone Health, What Every Woman Needs to Know. If you haven't done so already, please fill out your survey. The importance of this session will include bone health as it affects your overall health and well-being. It affects all of our lives, either personally, our friends, or our family members. The Grapevine Project is a program administered by the Wisconsin Women's Health Foundation. The WWHF is a 501c3 nonprofit that was founded in 1997 by First Lady Sue Ann Thompson. The Foundation Office is located in Madison and provides programs statewide. The organization is dedicated to improving the health and lives of women and their families through education, outreach programs, and partnership. The Grapevine Project is just one of their outreach programs that involves partnering with registered nurses to bring health education and resources to women in underserved areas. The Grapevine Project involves training nurses to present a series of women's health education units in communities throughout Wisconsin, and it is funded through grants and private donations. The Wisconsin Well Woman Program provides funding to support the Grapevine Project. The Well Woman Program is a state program that provides preventative health screening to women with little or no health insurance. Specifically, the program covers mammograms, pap tests, and multiple sclerosis testing for women with high risk. Today, I'm going to be going over um, several aspects of osteoporosis. And by the end of today's session, you'll be able to describe osteoporosis and osteopenia, identify the risk factors of osteoporosis, identify screening recommendations, and take steps to reduce your risks of osteoporosis. First, let's try the short quiz to see how much you know about osteoporosis. First question, osteoporosis thins and weakens the A, bones, B, ligaments, or C, muscles? A is the correct answer. Number two, osteoporosis is most common among A, older men, B, older women, C, among younger adults. B is the correct answer. Osteoporosis can strike at any age, but it is most common among older people, especially older women. Three, osteoporosis A cannot be prevented, B cannot be treated, or C can often be prevented and treated. The answer is C. Osteoporosis can often be prevented and treated. Proper diet, exercise, and treatment medications can help prevent further bone loss and reduce the risk of fractures. The American College of Preventative Medicine defines osteoporosis as the disease characterized by low bone mass and structural deterioration of bone tissue, leading to bone fragility and an increased susceptibility to fra fractures, especially of the hip, spine, and wrist. Osteoporosis is well known in the community as brittle bones and as a disease it places the elderly at risk for broken bones. However, it affects more than just the elderly. What many do not know is osteoporosis is present years before the diagnosis is made. For many, the diagnosis isn't made until a fracture has actually occurred. Community health nurses play an important role in educating the community. Our focus is on the promotion of wellness and prevention of disease diseases, much like osteoporosis and osteopenia. Before we discuss the ways to best educate and advocate for prevention of bone disease, let's first understand the basics of what osteoporosis and osteopenia are and what they mean for our communities. Bone mass, bone density, is the key to healthy bones and refers to the amount of bone present in the skeletal structure. Generally, the higher the bone density, the stronger the bones. Why are bones so important to our overall health? Bones are living, they're constantly growing, and they're a changing system. Bones provide structure to our bodies and are the foundation for our physical being. Without healthy bones, our structure begins to cave, putting our organs and muscles at risk. Healthy bones keep our bones aligned straight and our organs and muscles protected and anchored so that they can function at their best. Specific organs that our bones protect are our heart, lungs, 
liver, and spleen, all protected by a healthy spine and rib cage. Bones house bone marrow, the main source of blood formation in humans. As of 2011, 10 million people in the United States were diagnosed as having osteoporosis, and 80% of these were women. The number of people in the United States living with osteoporosis is almost twice the population of the entire state of Wisconsin, which was in 2010, 5.6 million people. An alarming fact is that this figure only represents the number of people who are diagnosed with the debilitating disease and does not account for the additional estimated 30 million who are not yet diagnosed. According to the 2012 U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Surgeon General's Report on Bone Health and Osteoporosis, over 3 million people were hurt each year due to complications from osteoporosis. One and a half million people suffer fractures and one third of those require hospitalization. Three and a half million people every year go to the emergency room or their doctor's office due to osteoporosis. That is nearly 10,000 people a day. This represents a tremendous cost to our healthcare system as caring for bone fractures from osteoporosis costs our healthcare system approximately $18 billion a year. $18 billion a year each year is nearly $15 million every day for a largely preventable disease. There are some signs and symptoms that can warn us of the risk of bone disease. Pain, pain in back in particular, spine and neck can be warning signs of osteoporosis or osteopenia. Other potential warning signs include poor posture in the form of kyphosis, which is also known or seen as a hump or hunchback. Osteopenia and even periodontal disease become present. When these symptoms are combined with risk factors such as family history, a personal history of fracture, sedentary lifestyle, the symptoms serve to be a legitimate warning of bone disease. Now let's take a look at two pictures. Here you'll see bone mass, also referred to as bone density, is the is the key to healthy bones and refers to the amount of bone present in the skeletal structure. Generally, the higher the bone density, the stronger the bones. Osteopenia, the one you see on the left, is the condition that comes before osteoporosis. This slide is a nice visual depicting the slight decrease in bone density seen in osteopenia compared with the blatant bone loss in osteoporosis. Many recent studies are investigating the associated risks of periodontal disease and osteoporosis. Patients with periodontal disease are becoming studied to discern if oral health is an indicator of bone health throughout the body. I digress from the notes here. Veterinary medicine has noted this for years. Uh, bone as well as cardiovascular uh, diseases can be detected on many animals' teeth before the signs and symptoms ever occur. Periodontal disease and osteoporosis have many of the same risk factors like family history, low body weight, late onset of menstruation, early menopause, and steroid use. On this slide you'll see risk factors for osteoporosis. They are discussed in terms of non-modifiable, those are things that you cannot change, and modifiable things that you can change. Let's start with the ones you can't control. The most well-known non-modifiable non risk for osteoporosis is family history of bone disease and a personal history of fragility fractures. Another important risk factor is age. For women, every decade of life beyond menopause increases the risk of developing fractures twofold. Ethnicity is another risk factor. Caucasian and Asian women are at a much higher risk for osteoporosis. And continued steroid use for a period of time greater than three months is also a contribution to bone density loss and increases the risk for osteoporosis. This next slide, you can see that we build our bones throughout our youth and into our mid-20s, reaching peak bone mass around 30. Even though preventing complications is possible at any age, promoting bone health early is important. Think of it 
as a savings account. The more money you build early in life, the better off you will be later in life. Estrogen plays an important part in, in this healthy development and the maturation of bone tissue. In menopause, estrogen levels drop rapidly, leading to the loss of bone mass. Most postmenopausal women lose about a third or more of their bone mass independently of age-related bone loss. Now, let's talk about risk factors that you can control. Not getting enough calcium and vitamin D. Not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Having an inactive lifestyle, smoking, and excessive alcohol use. Also, too much protein, sodium, and ca caffeine can leach calcium from your bones. Now that we've talked about some risk factors, let's discuss some ways to screen for osteopenia and osteoporosis. This slide shows three different methods. The first, the osteoporosis risk assessment instrument is an online tool developed by individuals from several medical institutions in Toronto and the University of Toronto. It measures risk based on age, weight, and estrogen therapy. Women with a score greater than nine should be referred for a bone density test. This is an online version. The Risk Factor Assessment Tool, or FRAX, F-R-A-X, developed by the World Health Organization is another online tool which measures both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors to determine a comprehensive score with recommendations. And lastly, the bone density test measures your actual bone density, which we will dis discuss further on the next slide. This is a photo of a DEXA x-ray machine. The scan provides an accurate bone mineral density result and it also helps women to plan steps that can change the risk for osteoporosis and fractures. The bone density test is recommended for women over the age of 65 or for women between 50 and 65 who have risk factors that we have mentioned previously. It is also recommended that women with a risk for osteoporosis should have a bone density test every two years. Currently, there are no formal recommendations for men regarding bone testing. Now, on this next slide, you'll see the osteoporosis test scores. The World Health Organization defines osteoporosis based on the Gold Standard Bone Density Assessment, or the BMD Assessment. The BMD Assessment is a specialized dual energy x-ray absorptiometric tool which is also known as the DEXA scan. It is a type of low dose x-ray that can be given to the hip and spine similar to an x-ray but focusing in on the spine and hips. This takes a little time and may be covered by insurance. It can also be done using a wrist or heel. The DEXA scan is a proven and valuable tool to determine the risk of and to lead to the diagnosis of osteoporosis. The BMD assessment scores are reported in terms of T-scores and Z-scores. A T-score or a Z-score of 0 to minus 1 is considered normal. Scores below that normal are indications of risk for disease. The higher your score, the more dense your bones. T-scores represent the bone density value associated to that of a young, healthy woman, approximately 30 years old. The Z-score represents the bone density value associated with another person of similar age, gender, and race. When T-scores or Z-scores are minus 2.5 standard deviations from zero, then the diagnosis of osteoporosis is likely. The more negative the number, the higher the risk of bone disease and fracture. Every change of one standard deviation means a two-fold increase in the risk for fracture. Example, if you were told you have a T-score of minus one, your chances of having a bone-related fracture is two times greater than if your T-score were zero. On this next slide, we see osteopenia and the test scores for that. Osteopenia is a disease of the bone that is characterized by low bone density, but not quite at a dangerous level to be seen as osteoporosis. Osteopenia is a warning sign of a condition that may lead to osteoporosis. It is sometimes viewed as a precursor of a more serious bone disease. 
The World Health Organization defines osteopenia as a T-score or a Z-score of minus 1 to minus 2.5. The good news is osteoporosis and osteopenia is largely prevented. Preventable, I should say. Prevention is the key. Start early and don't give up. Remember, building bone mass when you are young means you will have more to rely on as you age. So be sure to send the message to your family, members, and friends. It's important to note, however, that prevention measures are effective even in later life. Work on modifiable risks. By having a healthy diet, you can make sure to get the appropriate amounts of calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and potassium you need for healthy bones and avoid these things that can be a negative effect on your bones. Two risk factors which are entirely preventable are the use of alcohol and tobacco. Women of all ages and men should be encouraged to eliminate these modifiable risk factors, especially if there are other risk factors that exist. By controlling changeable risk factors, several scientific studies have proven that prevention of complications associated with the debilitating and costly disease is entirely possible. Get screened and if necessary, get tested. Talk to your healthcare provider about your risks. On this slide, you see several references for bone health and the commitment of these organizations. The first one is Best Bones Forever. It encourages girls from ages 9 through 14 and their friends to grow stronger together and stay strong forever. The second one is the National Osteoporosis Foundation, and it's the Bone Health Ambassadors. And these are folks who contribute their time and talent to help the foundation raise awareness for the importance of bone health at every stage in life. There you will find links to a recent article, blog posts, and videos, including the best of everything for After 50, which is an AARP video series. This next one shows our first take home message. As you can see from the table, women between 19 and 50 should consume 1,000 milligrams of calcium a day. And women over 50 should consume at least 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. These, of course, should be discussed with your doctor for individual dosing. On this next page, we see the importance of calcium and vitamin D. Our bodies need vitamin D in order to absorb calcium, but unfortunately, our bodies do not produce vitamin D in adequate amounts. Therefore, we must rely on outside sources of vitamin D, such as fortified milk, fatty fish, and even UV rays from sunlight in moderation. The most natural way to get vitamin D is by exposing your bare skin to sunlight. How much time needed will depend on the time of day, the time of year, where you live, and the color of your skin. You don't need to tan or burn to get your skin to receive the vitamin D. The best recommendation is to get half the sun exposure it takes for your skin to turn pink. The Vitamin D Council, which you see the website on our slide, has a great page on how to get additional vitamin D. You will notice that many foods like milk, orange juice, bread, and cereals are fortified with vitamin D. Magnesium and potassium are also important for the regulation of bone density and can be supplemented through foods and multivitamins. Potassium salts, such as bicarbonate and citrate, are, are plentiful in fruits and vegetables and also play an important part in improving bone health. If these salts are not consumed in adequate amounts to help reduce the acid state, alkalizing mineral deposits are drawn from the bone, which also weakens the bone. So, how do you get all the necessary calcium, vitamin D, magnesium, and potassium into your body? The best way is to eat a healthy and balanced diet. Fortunately, green leafy vegetables such as kale and fatty fish, like tuna and salmon, are rich in calcium. Vitamin D and magnesium and, and potassium are also available in green leafy vegetables. The same foods that are rich in calcium also contain vitamin D to optimize calcium include soybeans, almonds, and dairy products. There is a handout that you'll receive with this course today that has several options. Calcium rich foods such as broccoli, beans, uh, seafood, legumes, and some fruit are also available and listed on that sheet. Magnesium rich foods include nuts, seeds, fatty fish, 
beans, whole grains, avocados, yogurts, bananas, and the list goes on. Potassium-rich foods such as beans, dark leafy greens, potatoes, squash, all are considered safe and healthy. Supplementation with 600 milligrams of calcium twice a day is also beneficial. They found that it's best to supplement the 1200 milligrams, separating it once in the morning, once in the night. That's how you get the 600 milligrams. On this next page, you'll see some examples of supplements. It's best to get your calcium and vitamin D from food sources. However, most people cannot get the, all the amounts recommended. Calcium and vitamin D may be taken at meals, and calcium is best, as I mentioned previously, best taken at 600 milligrams twice a day for best absorption. Take home message number two, physical activity promotes bone health. Bone tissue is living tissue. Bones become stronger and thicker with use, just like muscles do. Bone healthy activities cause new bone tissue to form. Muscle supporting bones become stronger and activities enhance coordination and decrease the risk for falls. These are some recommendations according to the Surgeon General's report. Remember to consult with your health care provider before you start any exercise program. Strength training is an activity that produces a force on the bones and promotes the bone's growth and strength. Balance training is any activity that strengthens your muscles to help improve your balance and coordination, making you less likely to fall. Need some ideas? On this next slide, you see weight-bearing exercises. Note that some of the weightlifting or resistance training has been emphasized on this slide. We aren't talking about bodybuilding or bodybuilders who lift their own weight. You can use dumbbells ranging from 1 to 50 pounds. Start small and work your way up. And if you don't have dumbbells, you can use things around the house, such as cans of food or milk containers filled with sand or water. With today's session, you'll be receiving exercise bands and a nice handout with many exercises that you can do. Today, we're going to be showing you three examples that can be done with your bands right at home. First, Emily, our nursing student, is showing us how to do some squats. These are for your upper legs, your thighs, and well, you also will receive some benefit from your arms. Notice how she is squatting and pulling her arms up to her shoulders and moving slowly. The next one is bent rows. She, as you can see, she has her back slightly bent forward and pulling the bands up to her chest. And lastly, she's doing some bicep curls. These are for seated folks, or if you just want to try something else, take them to work, you can use them. These are for your upper arms, but be sure to always check with your healthcare provider before beginning any type of new exercise. Now let's talk about some balance training. Remember, balance training is an activity that strengthens your muscles to help improve your balance and coordination, making you less likely to fall. Listed here, we have swimming, cycling, stretching, flexibility exercises, Pilates, yoga, the sky's the limit. Resources. There's a lot of information and resources on the web. The American Bone Health provides bone information that supports strong and healthy bones and prevents osteoporosis. As you can see, the NIH, the National Institute of Health for Senior Living, and the Parents Guide to Bone Health has many downloadable references. The National Osteoporosis Foundation is a leading health organization dedicated to preventing osteoporosis. The Vitamin D Council is a nonprofit organization in California working to educate the public on vitamin D sun exposure, and health. Thank you all for coming today. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and have received some helpful information. You'll be receiving a follow-up survey in about four weeks' time, along with a return envelope. Please complete the survey and return it. These responses allow us to show potential funders that these presentations are making a difference. Thank you.